We do have Marissa. Um, Marissa Elena Duarte is a member of the Pascua Yaqui tribe in Arizona and is an assistant professor in justice and social inquiry at Ar Arizona State University. Her work focuses on indigenous people's uses of digital technologies and infrastructures for endurance and resistance. Her book, Network Sovereignty, Building the Internet Across Indian Country, came out in 2007 through the University of Washington Press. So I put my earrings in for the, you know, to indicate our social fabric of resistance, you know, indigenous women in our earrings. <laughs> sort of like Miranda, my colleague in Japan, Miranda gave these to me a couple days ago. And I was like, oh, I gotta put my earrings in. You know? <laughs> and sometimes we take them off, right? Yeah, yeah. For martial arts to contribute to our corero about indigenous martial arts. So, um, and, uh, you know, I um, have always had an adversarial stance about uh, this type of research, and it, it comes from being trained from a young age in martial arts as a native person, the Yaki person. And I'll go to these, like, social justice, I teach in a school that specializes in teaching social justice, and they're all about these non-adversarial, non-conflict type of stuff, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I can hang with you for about 10 minutes, but <laughs> that's it. So, so anyways, um, you know, I have framed my research in this really positive way because that's what gets me money, you know? Like, we can get information communication technologies for indigenous peoples, and Google's like, yeah, we like that, you know? It's a new market, right? And Facebook's like, that's awesome. We've been wanting to get the internet into, like, Papua New Guinea and stuff. And so that's how I, you know... Um, kind of cloak my research agenda, but really I'm just like trying to figure out how the surveillance apparatus that, you know, that is working against our peoples and how our peoples can push back. What do we have to do tactically, you know, in terms of material infrastructure um, with regard to these large scale um, technologies. So I'm going to just um, step, I'm trying to decide, I have to do this thing with technology studies where we scale, super scale down, you know, the micro, micro, micro all the way to the macro macro and what are the techniques for doing that. So I'll start with the micro micro and just give a quick definition of an algorithm. So an algorithm is any problem that solve, that produces a binary, that can be solved with a binary solution. Any problem, right? Any problem at all. Um, should I turn off my phone? This is Tina's phone. I'm, I'm pointing to Tina's phone on purpose because she... <laughs> 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 and Siri was spying on us the whole time. <laughs> so should I turn off my phone? Yes or no, right? And like, you know, no. And then it leads to this other thing later on until you come up with a solution for that. I'm going to sit on the phone. And then another solution after that. You know, and so um, these algorithms, different uh, platforms, we call them platforms now. It used to be that social media companies were truly just like a, a, a website, you know, that had like a database, some sort of relational data, database behind it. They've become these multinational corporations that operate as what we call platforms, which means that they're a suite of associated social media um, sites and functionality that essentially allow people to uh, give their data over to these large corporations. And the corporations always say, this is a legal fiction. Here's one. There's many of them, right? Here's one. They tell you your data belongs to you. It does not belong to you. They tell you your data can be erased. It is never erased. They have it. You know, they tell you it can't be reassembled and given back to you. That is, a compl that is completely untrue. You know, and the only way we know this is because as technologists, we have colleagues who make these things. And so they can reverse engin engineer it. And they're like, that company, they're telling you they have this specialized algorithm. They have no idea what the algorithm is. They made it in the 90s. And they just kept on solving one yes or no, then another yes or no, then another yes or no, you know, all the way. And so they can't reverse engineer. They don't know what it is. They're just telling you they've got the secret sauce. But they don't know what it is, right? And a lot of them will make it up. You know, they'll just say, yeah, it does this and this and this, and then you'll have a computer science. I was at a conference in the Netherlands two, two winters ago. Computer sci uh, scientists and physicists from the Max Planck Institutes were looking at these algorithms that were pertaining to, um, that are applied to determine, to sort of calculate whether or not uh, a criminal, you know, was likely to recidivate, to commit the same crime that, you know, got them locked up in the first place. And they in input all this data from the caseworker and all this and load it up and and it 
turns out this thing based on this special algorithm, and it, for some reason it kept on saying that you know, kept on saying that women of color, black women, were thirty percent more likely to recidivate regardless, even if their conditions, you know, the data we call it training data in machine learning, if the training data that were put in were the same as white males, even if the white male committed a worse crime that it just, you know, we know from human intelligence is likely to, you know, they're gonna repeat again, like larceny or burglary or, or some fraud, something like that. Always a black woman, you know, was always, the, the, the algorithm would spit this out. And why? Because somebody made an algorithm years ago, affixed to the formula years ago, which was deeply embedded in the secret sauce, that was deeply racist. Mm -hmm. And you add that to the structural racism of those forms that, that the caseworker fills out and the fact that our black populations are targeted even more, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, so you have layers of racism. So I point out, I'm going to the micro, the algorithm, so that you can see that, you know, alongside sort of these machine learning problems that are just sort of layered, racism is layered deep, um, our structural racism is contributing to those at the same time. They're occurring in parallel, okay? All right. So this is the micro. Now I'm going to go up to the macro, way, way, way up high. And as a political scientist, you know, we can turn to um, how do we understand government? Well, there's various forms, and we're talking about nationalist sovereignty, right? And that gives um, the Westphalian nation states the state sanction over violence. You know, nobody else is allowed to be violent under sovereignty. And it's worse reading of the word. You know, sovereignty basically is the sovereign's right to determine uh, life and death over its citizen subjects, okay? And we, and we have to pay attention to this as tribal peoples because sometimes we'll claim sovereignty and we know that some of our tribal leaders are unjust. And they make rules that are basically determining whether or not, you know, we are able to vote if we live, you know, on our territories or not. You know, they make rules about a woman's body an indigenous woman's body, they make rules about the ch you know, children mm -hmm. and things like that. And so they are engaging in some of these colonial practices. Okay, governmental form. Then we'll go down to ideology and we look at white supremacy. And we know that white supremacy's ideology is to have uh, the social sanction over the nature of reality. White is right. The white woman is always innocent. She just has to cry, <laughs> you know? She just has to cry those big alligator tears. And, you know, it's like our people are dying, you know what I mean? You know, they're stealing the children. And it just takes one white woman to cry on television about, like, some animals that need neutering or spaying, and they play some, like, ethereal music, and everybody's like, I should give my money to that, you know? <laughs> my guilt is assuaged, you know? And it's like, okay, you know? And so that, um, that's the ideology, right? And um, if we go down another level, what is the disciplinary logic that upholds these two in you know, contemporary society? It's usually you know, logics of incarceration and conformity. You know, suburbs in the United States are these pockets that are it, like beautiful prisons. They have these nice gated communities and this is where you get your water. And you know, the settlers think they are very modern and we're like, um, that's actually not where you're supposed to get your water. You're supposed to get it from rivers and streams and aquifers and, and lakes. And you're not supposed to get it from like a tap. You know, that's institute, you've been institutionalized, but they, they love that, right? They like to live in boxes, okay? And they like to put our people in boxes, you know, and to lock them up. And if we look in contemporary society, what are the mechanisms that allow this to happen? It's the book. It's the paper. This is hard for us because we are scholars. We like books. I'm a librarian. I love books. <laughs> but that is a technology, you know, where it says, this is reality. How is it so? Because I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I have a PhD. And this is reality here, right? So we say this is our contemporary sort of things that we don't doubt to be true, you know? And if we go back, it looks really funny. You know, um, uh, there was a time, and we have heard it referenced, where the church was the was the supreme the supreme order of the land, right? And we would go back and we'd say, well, their ideology was not white supremacy; it was Spanish supremacy. It had this, the uh, the social sanction over the nature of reality was a Spanish truth. I still meet Spanish scholars who tell me, oh, but we had to take over your lands because we were running out of space. And they're really serious. And I'm like, were you just joking right now? And they're like, no, no, you know, we had to do it. You know, they're really, really serious. 
And and that's astonishing to me, right? Um, we'll go back, you know, and we've mentioned this before, we're talking about national sovereignty, but if we go back to the Vatican and the Holy Roman Empire, how these work together, that was sort of like, it wasn't, it wasn't only that uh, the church was the law of the land, but it was the church plus the crown, you know, as Dr. Harry mentioned, and the Bible was the book. It wasn't just books, it was the book. So all books are laden with the power of the Bible, okay? So I'm Yaki, my religion is, we have a Yaki Catholicism, and, uh, and we became Catholic, I argue, you know, as a tactic, a tactic of survival, right? Because all you have to do is peer through the Catholicism, just scratch the surface just a bit, and there's some indigenous stuff under there <laughs> that's like, you know, basically, I joke, but it's true, every year the church sends us a, a priest, you know, who's been misbehaving in some other part of the world. <laughs> to, our, <laughs> to our little, you know, plot of urban blight outside of Tucson, Arizona, you know, and to convert us more and make us, and that person ends up becoming more yaki than, uh, mm -hmm. than Catholic and often then gets sent off to some other rock, you know, <laughs> like in some other remote area. Um, okay, and he tries to tell us that we have a soul. And Yaquis have begun to speak about having a soul. They believe they have a soul. And a lot of indigenous peoples, I hear them talking about having a soul. But to disrupt that, I want to talk, go back to this idea of the algorithm and all that data that gets collected when we use social media, right? And when we uh, sort of um, engage in these spaces. There's such a thing now that scholars are calling the data double. Have any of you heard of this phrase, the data double? Miranda has, yeah, because we're in the high school, so we talk about it all the time. So the data double is essentially that agglomeration of data that Google has, that Amazon has crafted about me because I buy stuff on Amazon. You know, every time I use Google Docs, my, my Gmail is sort of like surveilled and mined and da 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 and they're like, okay, Dr. Duarte fits this category of humanity. You know, uh, she shops at, at, for these things at Amazon. You know, um, she uh, donates to these social justice organizations. Her Facebook profile is this leftist kind of like person or whatever. You know, she uses Instagram and, you know, she says she's a pacifist, but it doesn't look like it, whatever. So they have this whole, like, <laughs> this is for show. <laughs> so they have this whole, this, that's called the data double, okay? And in some countries, like in China, that data double is given a social number. It's kind of like a, a credit number or something. And in China, this hasn't happened in other countries of the world, but in China, that number will determine whether or not a person gets to buy a house, whether or not they get to go into a restaurant, whether or not they get to go to school, how they get to participate completely. And it's determined based on their friend connections through social media and who they're related to as well, right? Okay, so I don't want you to think that this is some science fiction thing happening, right? Because it's actually happening in all countries you know, where people are using the internet and so forth to engage and interact. It's just that we don't realize it. So the Pentagon was recently caught for applying Project Maven. It's an artificial intelligence surveillance software to track activists and other, you know, teachers, basically everybody in this room. Um, <laughs> we're friends on social media, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> your Project Maven has you in there. Catch, you know. And um, and basically is using that to sort of um, track, you know, where, you know, people are sort of like traveling around the world. And so we have, indigenous, in the U.S., we have indigenous activists who have a, um, a code. It's, it's like a, a four S's that are it's on their passport. And they get stopped every time and prevented from going into different countries and things like this. And the U.S. is supposedly we have this thing called civil liberties and civil rights. But I want to argue that um, civil liberties and civil rights, when you're talking about this platform society, you know, the data double is the equivalent of the soul. What the Catholic Church determined was the soul. The soul belonged to the church. It's a non-rivalrous good, which means that many people can profit from it at the same time. Where the body belonged to the plantation owner, the ejidal owner, whoever ran the hacienda, the Spanish criollo, like the, you know, who was sort of pushing indigenous people into labor, okay? So now the data double, our data doubles, our souls, because we don't believe in God anymore in these skeptical scientific, techno-scientific regimes. You know, our data doubles are our souls. And they belong to Facebook and Google. And Facebook and Google, they're friends with people like Peter Thiel, 
you know, of talent here. Peter Thiel is this known white supremacist. He's a, he's a horrible human being. T H I E L. You can look him up. And he um, helped, you know, there was just a handful of these guys in Silicon Valley who really created these platforms. And he's operating uh, Palantir. It's called Palantir, P A L A N T I R. It's an international private security firm that is for hire by various governments to kind of track disruptions. And they provide data to support basically, you know, the power of the G20, the people who are in the topmost you know, profitable patent, patenting and scientific organiz countries, excuse me, in the United States, in the world, rather. The, the U.S. is like the leader of this, right? Um, next to Palantir, they have these spin-off corporations. They're all named after these Tolkien places, you know, places from the Tolkien universe. Yeah, because we're in the Shire. It's just, you know, all the, there's just people go take pictures of the Shire, and I'm like, watch out for Palantir people. It's real. <laughs> so, Anduril... Anduril is another weapon of surveillance that's being used currently. And they're using data doubles that we give them. We believe in the soul, and we gave it to them. We believe in our data double, and we're giving it to them. So these are legal fictions that we need to really push back at. One is the idea that data is property. No, it is not. 